This is an episode of Reasonably Sound Classic. For the first 30-some episodes, this podcast was distributed by Infinite Guest, American Public Media's podcast network. Thus, it benefited from blanket broadcast licenses held with every music publisher. After going independent, pretty much all intro, outro, and interstitial music had to be removed. The intro and outro music you're going to hear is an in-progress version of Reasonably Sound's theme, written by Will Stratton. The awkward silences are where act break music used to be, so if you could just imagine like Queen or The Misfits or Kate Bush along the way, that would be great. If you want to support Reasonably Sound in the hopes that maybe one day I'll be able to afford some blanket licenses of my own, you can check out the Patreon at patreon.com forward slash reasonably sound. Okay, on with the show. Hey everyone, before we get started, I just want to say quickly that since it's getting to be that time of year where, you know, you look back on the last 12 months and think about all the things you accomplished and get maybe a little steamy-eyed and sentimental, um, I just want to say a big thank you uh, to you uh, for listening to Reasonably Sound, for talking to me on the internet about sounds and audio and all the things related, um, and an extra special thanks to everyone who has uh, supported the show through its Patreon. It has been an amazing outpouring of support and a greater success than I would have ever expected. So um, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, And on that note, on to a vaguely Thanksgiving-themed episode. I hope everybody travels safe and has only pleasant interactions with their families. The day before Thanksgiving is the most traveled day in the United States every year. Nearly 50 million Americans are expected to travel 50 or more miles from home to be with their families. An estimated 91% of Thanksgiving Day trips are made by car, and during the 12 days AAA calls the Thanksgiving travel period, it's estimated that some 24.6 million people will fly. The average long-distance trip will be about 216 miles, which means if you're one of the many very lucky people hitting the road, you will have some free time to catch up on all of your podcasts. So we're going to try to make this episode of Reasonably Sound short-ish and relevant. What follows are a few short tidbits you may find fun to share with your fam around the dinner table during the lulls in conversation between, of course, arguing about politics and comments about the quality of the cranberry sauce. So we've all been in that situation where you're at a dinner party or a restaurant or somewhere and suddenly, just as you're getting to the climax of your story about the time in college, you slipped on the fresh and last I showed everyone my butt. The room goes quiet. For seemingly no reason. And here's you. The center of attention. Having just shouted about your butt. Well, you were screaming in the first place because of something called the Lombard effect. It's the tendency for speakers to raise the volume of their speech in noisy environments. And mostly, you do it involuntarily, so you don't notice that it's happening. You can train yourself to be conscious of the Lombard effect, but uh, I don't know. Methinks the training may be no match for a noisy party and a couple cocktails. Anyways, what happens is that there's some base level noise, some general kitchen clanking, a football game playing in the background, some music or other conversation and you talk over it. But then other people talking nearby need to talk over you, and people near them over them and you and you over everyone. And so there's this kind of acoustic arms race until for one reason or another, a reason surely at the hands of chaos and not randomness, the scene suddenly quiets more quickly than you can perceive and there you are shouting about your butt. Don't worry, it happens to the best of us, and now, the next time it does happen, you can recover by describing exactly what just happened. Just try to keep it down.
Not a lot happens in American football, a.k.a. hand egg. So when it does happen, it's important that it is as exciting as possible. The sounds of the players making contact with one another ups the excitement factor greatly, but raises a question. How do the people making the football TV get those sounds? Those dudes are out there on the field, a good distance away from any of the crew, yet often their collisions sound crisp and clear nearby. Well, all of those audio details are there thanks to three different kinds of microphones. The first are called parabolic mics, and they're the easiest to spot. Uh, They're usually constructed out of two parts. The first is a shotgun mic, which is a long and cylindrical microphone often used in video production and known for its directionality. A shotgun mic unlike its namesake, will only cover a very narrow band of area extending out from directly in front of it. A shotgun mic is pointed into a parabolic dish, a smooth, curved plastic shape that looks sort of like a small satellite dish or a really wide salad dish kind of thing. Sometimes they're gray, but mostly they're clear because since they're usually held at about head height with two hands, it's important that the person doing the head height holding can see whatever oncoming athletes are rushing their way. Parabolic mic operators are very easy to spot on the sidelines. Uh, They usually wear a yellow vest and have a terrified look on their face. The transparency of the dish also helps with operation. Parabolic mics get pointed where the action is. You can think of them actually kind of like a spotlight. But instead of illuminating the target, they're recording whatever sounds it makes. If you want to hear something, you got to point the dish, the reflector, in the right place. And it can be tough to know what the right place is, so that's why operators put them right in front of their heads and just move their whole body back and forth. The arrangement of shotgun mic and reflector means that sound waves created by running and colliding athletes gets focused into the dish and sent into the microphone. The problem with parabolic mics, though, is that they're best for capturing high frequencies. Lower frequencies have larger wavelengths, which are too big to be easily caught by a small parabola. Often, those sounds are picked up by area mics. Area microphones come in a bunch of different flavors, depending upon the location and the game. And, you know, I said we were going to keep this short, so I'm not going to go through all of them. I'm just going to talk about my favorite one, which is the one that is on sometimes, though not always, the Skycam or the Spidercam, which is the camera robot that zips along those lines placed directly above the field. Uh, There are different setups for different stadiums, but if you can catch a glimpse of that camera robot, you may see this big honking microphone sticking out of the bottom of it. Uh, I don't know if it's used for broadcast, but man, do I love the idea of a robot mic chasing the action. And finally, the final football mic is just, it's on the field. On players, actually. This is a rather recent development, and one that came with no small amount of controversy. Certain players, often but not always the quarterback, have lav mics and wireless transmitter packs installed into their pads, into the shoulder, under some serious protective foam. Sound engineers work with the team, the equipment manager, everyone, and the packs and labs get installed hours before game time. Shannon Furman, a producer who works with the NFL, has said that this can mean players forget that they're mic'd, which keeps them from being self-conscious and leads to great, authentic game time banter on broadcast. I think it's fair to say that there's probably a full episode of Reasonably Sound in here somewhere. So I'm going to put a pin in this. And speaking of speaking, here we are at the last of our three sound bites where audio is implicated, that's a joke, you just don't know why yet, though not factored directly as such. So imagine you're seated around the dinner table. Cousin Alex looks up from dinner and asks, is the butter on the table? 
And Uncle Alvin responds, well, the salt is right here. And he points, continuing uh, with his other hand to swirl his gravy around in his mashed potatoes as it becomes a kind of dull brown soup. Alex finds the butter tray, picks it up, slices a small pad off for a dinner roll, and puts it back down. So what just happened here. When Alex asked for the butter, was there an expectation that it be handed over? When Alvin responded, why was he talking about salt, something Alex didn't ask for at all? And furthermore, was he willfully ignoring a clear, though not explicitly stated, request? In hindsight, we may now know it was Alex's intention to butter a roll, but in the moment, it may have been perfectly reasonable to assume Alex was simply being helpful, making sure an often needed object was, in fact, present. Meaning, Alvin, responding about the location of the salt, which was apparently helpful to some degree, yet not actually passing the butter, is a reasonably defensible reaction. The whole arrangement of statements, reactions, and thoughts here relies on our understanding of something called conversational implicature, or just implicature for short. There are assumptions we make, both in communicating with and understanding other people, that allow us to be less than perfectly explicit. Because if it were necessary, that were the case, we would go mad. Imagine if, when Alex wanted the butter, Alex had to say, Is anyone aware of the location of the butter? And if they are, and such awareness results in knowledge that butter is within their easy grasp, could whoever is within easy grasp of the butter please hand it to me so that I may put some of it on my bread? Ugh. Similarly, Alvin understands, and most likely understands, that Alex understands that Aunt Cheryl always puts the butter and salt out together in that little matching white ceramic dish set. So, potentially, absent the knowledge of the location of the butter, knowledge of the location of the salt is the next best thing. If Alvin had to explicitly communicate this thought process, and others like it, dinner would be a very long and tedious affair. And so... Implicature. Im implicature. Im implicature is a very weird word to say. Implicature is important in pragmatics, the study of how people, with differing subjectivities and sets of knowledge, transmit messages and meaning between one another in certain situations. It's all about communication happening in a context. One of the foundational ideas of pragmatics is a set of rules, but they're also not really rules, about the ways we communicate that are mostly assumed by listeners and exploited by speakers. They're things like, don't lie. Say just the right amount of stuff to get your point across. Your contribution should be relevant. Your statements should be clear. As a set, these are known as the Gricean maxims. They inform a larger concept known as the cooperative principle. Generally, in communication as in other pursuits, we assume that our fellow human beings want to cooperate. These maxims and implicature help us understand how a seemingly non-cooperative statement, the location of the salt, is actually cooperative. Because Alex can assume that Alvin intends the statement to be so, and so searches for the meaning which makes it so. But a problem with family dinner, maybe not Alex and Alvin specifically in this situation, but family dinner in general, is that it's often difficult to know when, how, or if a family member is being cooperative. Among family, extended family even more so, it's often more likely we will over-imply or assume what we know is also something they know when it isn't and unintentionally flout one of Grice's maxims. We may be exceptionally unclear or seemingly irrelevant when in fact we are just trying to cooperate. We may hint or perform what Brown and Levinson call off record requests. We may hint, but obliquely. So over dinner this week and maybe all other weeks, when it comes to asking if there's a free chair over there or to passing the butter, at least, let's just assume we're all trying to cooperate. My name is Mike Rignetta, and this podcast has been 
Reasonably Sound. You can find Reasonably Sound on Twitter and Instagram at Reasonably SND and on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash Reasonably Sound. You can find me, Mike Rugnetta, on Twitter, Tumblr, Instagram, and Snapchat at Mike Rugnetta. I showed everyone my butt.